And while I was freelancing, I was bouncing around to different shops and, and, and working a bit. And I had this opportunity to work at Boeington Film Production. And Boeington was a small company built by a guy named Paul Boeington. Visual effects was a key part of what he was doing, but he was really, he was a director and he was really looking to do different things. But his claim to fame had been these title sequences, these opening title sequences with big miniature landscapes and motion control cameras sort of flying through them. And he had done um, this Rick D's talk show, uh, this radio personality guy um, flying through there. And he had done uh, this HBO um, open that was kind of famous at the time and people paid a lot of attention to. So, so he was like, if you were doing that kind of shot, he was a guy that you went to because he um, had proven his kind of aptitude at designing those kinds of shots. He had a small model shop in the back and he kind of brought in freelancers and stuff like that. And so anyway, he reached out to me and said like, he was bidding on Ed Wood. Would I like to come in and run the model shop for him on, on this Ed Wood movie that Tim Burton was making? And I was like, yeah, of course I would. And, and I was an ambitious guy. And so I was like, so what if I don't have a ton of experience? I was pretty sure I knew how to do it. And so, um, so anyway, so he was bidding, I remember he was bidding against uh, Mark Stetson and Stetson Visual Services. And, and you know, Stetson was kind of like an A player. I mean, they were doing big, big shows and they were, um, you know, tons of experience. And But they were also, you know, maybe a little more expensive. And um, Tim Burton was really looking for uh, for this Ed Wood movie, he was really looking to lean into Ed Wood's kind of kitschy, kind of not quite believable aesthetic, I guess you would say. Boeington's reel, which maybe wasn't as good as Stetson's, suddenly was an asset to them. Um, and then they also were able to do it considerably cheaper. I think our bid was quite a bit less than, than Stetson's was. Um, so anyway, we got the job and uh, that was exciting. And immediately we had to jump in, and the very first thing was really urgent. We had a, only had a, like a week or two to crank out this miniature of Hollywood Boulevard, or sorry, Hollywood, um, kind of the Hollywood landscape. And it was actually for it to be a prop, like a set dressing prop in the movie that they were going to shoot a scene where Edward was literally like flying the flying saucers from fishing poles and things like this. It had to look really bad. It had to look like Ed Wood level stuff. But it was the very first thing we were delivering and I remember thinking, well, sure it has to look bad, but but just how bad <laughs> does it have to look? Because we didn't want to lose the job because we delivered this crappy model. Um, so it was, we worked with the production designer, Tom Duffield, to try and like set the level of just how bad it had to be. Um, and we cranked that out really fast and that was like just really simple wood construction and we painted everything. The whole movie was black and white and so we actually, they even the sets that they had built, um, they painted in, in shades of gray and, and so we did the same thing with the miniatures that we built for them. Everything was just shades of gray. We didn't do anything in color. From there, we went to the big model, which was, which was a big fly out, is opening the movie. I mean, so basically the two sort of opens to the movie. First was the this haunted house kind of house that we fly into. Putting that together, I immediately was like thinking about something I had done at Boss Film, which I had worked on uh, the Tales from the Crypt opening. And we had built this 12 scale, sort of dollhouse scale house at Boss for Tales from the Crypt. And the whole landscape around it and, and the, the, the front gate and the whole thing. And it was all a big flying, very similar kind of approach. And that model had been absolutely stunning. So I said, well, okay, I'll do the same thing. I'll build a 12 scale version of this house. We use dollhouse parts and things like this. We we'll dollhouse shingles and dollhouse windows and all this kind of stuff. But Paul um, uh, Boeington, uh, you know, he was kind of like on the fringes of the of the, the mainstream visual effects business. But I felt like this, you know, this thing had to look great and I knew it had to look great and this was a big shot for Paul. So made the argument that we should bring in one of my friends from Boss to build that house. And, and so that's ultimately what we did. We got uh, Kento Gibo to come in and build this house for us and he did an amazing job on it, it's beautiful. 
piece. Little motion control windows that would open when the camera came up close and, and, and things like this. So that was the main, you know, kind of kickoff. And I remember we spent a lot of time on that tree, making sure the tree uh, in the front, which is all manzanita branches and kind of glued together and painted and whatever. And we, we spent a lot of time on that with, with the production designer trying to really kind of nail Tim Burton's aesthetic, which is a very specific kind of tree which we now kind of, I think, looking back on it, we know what that is. But at the time, it wasn't quite as obvious to me. And then we turned our attention to the big Hollywood miniature. So it was tricky, right? Because I, I had never, I'd worked on a bunch of stuff with people, but I'd never really set something up from scratch. You know, as the lead on this project, I, I, I was sort of confounded initially with how to plan it. Uh, we had to find a scale that would work for this thing. And, and basically what we ended up doing was a forced perspective model. So the, the, the mountains were not that big and then we started with kind of like uh ho scale cars and small little stuff on the freeway and then worked our way toward back towards i i believe it was 48th scale i think at the at the front end of the model it was all designed around the camera move that we had figured out for how to do this i remember burton wanted the thing to look kind of funky like he wanted it to look like he wanted bumps in the motion control move and all that kind of stuff and we we were just like yeah, we're not not doing that. But, you know, the scale itself kind of lent an air of funkiness to the whole thing. So it was kind of what he was looking for, I think. In building it, you know, we had to start with the mountains. And I think the way you would typically build mountains like that at that time was uh, uh, wood form with chicken wire on it. And then you'd spray foam it, carve the foam, and uh, and then paint it and stuff like that. And, and we, we couldn't afford the foam. We couldn't afford the foam. I mean, I think that because our budget had been really kind of con constrained, I mean, um, by the bidding process, we we basically, we were like, well, we can't afford the foam. And so Paul Paul was like, well, I, you know, why don't you use um, aluminum foil and just paint it? And so we just crinkled up. We did the, the wood form and the chicken wire, and then we just basically crinkled up aluminum foil and we put it all over the chicken wire with spray adhesive. And painted it. It actually looked all right. I mean, it didn't hold up very well over time, but you know, it just had to work for this one shot, so it was a, sort of okay. And then we had the freeway, which you know had little cars on monofilament on the stepper motors, just simple kind of simple tricks to kind of give some movement to things. Lots of like Christmas lights. We were just using Christmas lights for background city lights and stuff like this. And then once you get down into the street, then we you know now we're dealing with proper buildings and things like this. But we really wanted to focus on the iconic buildings that you would remember because. Um, we didn't want to spend a lot of time, uh, you know, on, on other buildings, it's kind of your mind's eye remembrance of what Hollywood might be. I did a ton of research on Hollywood at that period of time, but ultimately it was like it had to cram into this set that was fairly small. <laughs> so, so we sort of picked all the big buildings that you wanted to see that you kind of remembered and stuff like this. And then I remember we spent a bunch of time on, on we, we couldn't do neon, we couldn't do miniature neon um, our scale was way too small for it and our budget was way too small for it too. So we used uh, grain of wheat bulbs and just, and just, we would just pepper them around the sign. So they kind of, the scale was a little, a little dodgy, but it, it worked all right. One of the things that was interesting about Ed Wood, uh, on that model that I, you know, it was a little bit hard to put your finger on. It was sort of like, it, it just looked, it didn't look real until we put in all the palm trees and we had to make a ton of palm trees because we sort of did the math. And there's, you don't even think about it because palm trees in Los Angeles are kind of ubiquitous and they're just, you just sort of ignore them at a certain point, but they're all over the place. And there's a palm tree every like 15, 20 feet or something, it feels like, and, and there, there are a ton of palm trees. And so we had to come up with a clever, inexpensive way to make palm trees, <laughs> miniature palm trees. And um, we ultimately had, you know, one of our PAs just sitting there cutting out palm tree leaves. I just made a pattern and and then we would just cut them out of con literally construction paper. And then, I mean, we made hundreds and hundreds of these trees, um, which is the name of the game when you're building a city model. It's really all about repetition. There's just so much, you know, so many street lamps and telephone poles and uh, trees and things like this. They're just like every, they're just constant. And then you start thinking about in a modern city, you know, parking meters and all this other stuff. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into making something like that seem real. And, uh, and it, it took a ton of time for us to make all this stuff. Uh, the main buildings are what you kind of remember, but there's all this other stuff creating texture. It's really important. So we built the, we built the whole, uh, we put the whole thing together. And I remember when we went to, 
sort of set up the camera move, it became clear that for the camera to get out as far as it needed to get out, it basically had to go from the, we had a motion control camera with a track running long ways down the set, and the boom couldn't reach the center of the, couldn't get the camera to the middle of the set, and then there's a snorkel lens on the end of that camera, right? So the lens is like kind of like two inches cruising through there. We couldn't get the camera out far enough, so we had to build an extension for uh, Paul Boeington's motion control rig, which was pretty wanky setup. And so um, it meant we had to shoot really, really slow, both for the depth of field, but also to kind of let the camera settle before we would take an exposure. And so shooting this model would take like 18 hours passes or something like this. And we were shooting black and white film. So the matte pass for the sky had to be a front light back light pass. We had to literally change all the lighting so that the model was silhouetted and the background was white for this for that pass and everything had to register perfectly. So you had to shoot very, very slow and very steady. And we had to shoot that, we shot that thing, I don't even know how many times, we shot it over and over and over again. There was just always something going wrong. They, you know, we'd go one time and the cars wouldn't move, or we'd go another time and the, and the, uh, the, one of the lights on the, one of the buildings would go out or something like this. We also had a, we had a, a gag where um, uh, one of the buildings on, um, on Fountain was too tall the, uh, to, 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 for the boom to get past. So we'd have, we had it on hinges. We'd have to like hinge it down as the thing went by. So once it was out of frame, we would hinge it out of the way. Then the camera would go past. But that thing had to register perfectly every pass. Otherwise it wouldn't line up. So then I remember we also had rain. Rain was a part of this whole setup. And so Paul had this idea to do miniature rain. And so we actually got misters and created mist, like a ton of mist, uh, on all on black, and shot the same camera move just to get rain that would line up to the plate. Paul's shop, if you can call it that, that would be generous, was basically sort of like working out of a storage container. It was, it was, it was like a, when it would rain, you had to be careful where you left your tools because they would, your toolbox would literally fill up with water water and that's happened to people um we i had i made him buy a proper table saw so we had a good table saw that we could cut do straight cuts but like almost everything else in the place was like pretty rusty dodgy stuff that he had gotten at garage sales or something i don't even know um and he had been in business a long time so like there were a lot of like he had upstairs in the attic he had all this old stuff that you kind of a hoarder's paradise up there that you could go and just find things and find materials you needed or find, you know, I remember we were doing the lake and we found like an old piece of rippled plexiglass and, you know, just like that had been used for something else and just tore it off. And the smaller shops tended to run that way. Fantasy II had a similar kind of thing, but this was like a whole nother level of this. And, and uh, I remember we, I sent one of the guys up to like root around through the molds to see if we could find anything useful for something we were trying to build. And, and he comes down and he's like, I think I was just bit by a spider. <laughs> like it ended up being a brown recluse spider and he had to go to the hospital and like some kind of like crazy thing with his veins and stuff like this. But that was just another day at, Bo at Boeington. I mean, that's what it was like. It, it was always, it was just like a crazy place and we, we, we weren't paying people very well. So um, people were on 14 hour flat deal memos. <laughs> which is not normal. And, um, and so, you know, and 14 hours was a normal day there. I mean, it was common that we were working even more. We were just, but I was just busting my ass. I just wanted to try and do a great job. I really thought this was kind of my shot to kind of elevate my, uh, my station in this industry. And, um, and so, you know, I was really trying hard to, to do it. Um, ultimately, we got the we got the big shots done, um, and and things were were good. We were wrapping things up. I had another show to go do somewhere else, so I left. Uh, some additional stuff came up. But Burton wanted to do his title sequence, which was through a graveyard. My sort of second in command uh, during that entire job was Jared Pajawa, and he was amazing. And so he stayed on and kind of like ran that shop for the additional stuff that was done. I was a big fan of Tim Burton's and I was excited because Edward Scissorhands and Beetlejuice and all these movies had, had, had been there. And, and then we got the dailies, we got some dailies for, um, for Ed Wood while we were working. 
And we were so excited because we were like, man, we're working on the next Tim Burton movie. This is going to be awesome, which it ultimately was. But we got the dailies and we were just like seeing Johnny Depp in an Angora sweater, like with this weird voice. And we were like, what have we gotten ourselves into? What is happening? This is going to be, the, I don't understand. <laughs> but in the end, the movie makes sense and it was incredible.